Alrighty, what have we been talking about? Three things that will last how long? Forever. Can we put our verse up? Let's read our verse together. You know what? Let's do something different. Can we take a deep breath? Everybody take a deep breath. Exhale. Look at your neighbor next to you. Tell him, goose fraba, all right? Okay, so now let's stand to our feet. I want us to stand to our feet, and we are going to read the Word of God standing in honor of the Word of God. We're going to do this today, let's, and I want you to remain standing until I tell you to sit down. It's going to be a standing service. Watch this. I, Put the next verse. Remain standing. You are good readers. I really like the way you read. Okay, let's look at this. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Are you ready to read this with me? Are you ready to read this with me? Okay, let's do this. One, two, three. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. Mm. What makes life worth living? The foundation of what? Of what? Faith. Of our faith. Don't your neighbors say, life is worth living when you live it by faith. Then ask them, look them square in the eye, say, how's your faith? All right, and now you can be sick because now they're mad at you, so now you can sit down. Well, if you missed uh, the last couple of weeks, then you can go on, uh, uh, you know, the Rock app or you can listen to the podcast. Uh, but the Bible tells us about these three things. And uh, the definition of faith that we put in there is that faith is being fully persuaded that God is in control of the outcome of my future and to possess a stubborn determination to see His will happen in my life regardless of what I'm going through today. Uh, we learned last week that faith is spiritual currency. Faith is money. Money in God's kingdom. So that means to operate in God's kingdom, I need faith. Faith is what we call kingdom currency. Uh, that enables me to live out kingdom values wherever I go and whatever circumstance I find myself in. Meaning that faith is not just limited to spiritual things. How many of you understand that? That faith is, affects everything. Galatians 3.11 says that the just or the righteous shall live by faith. What does it mean? That means I need faith to be born again. I need faith to receive. I need faith to forgive. I need faith to submit. I need faith to perceive and understand. I need faith to heal. I need faith to fight. I need faith to persevere. I need faith to overcome. I need faith to live. Why is that? Because the just shall live by faith, and faith is how you do what? How you please God. How many of you want to please God with your life? If you want to please God with your life, then you have to live a life of faith. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, what faith is not, and maybe uh, next week or so, but right now, I want us to understand this. Living a life of faith means that my faith not only affects every part of my life, but it directs every part of my life. A person of faith should always be directed by their faith, not only pertaining to spiritual things. How many of you understand that the way you do your job, you can please God? How many of you understand the way that you have your marriage, you can please God? How many of you understand the way that you raise your kids, you can please God? Everything that you do, the way that you handle your finances, you can please God. The way that you treat other people, you can please God. Because everything that we do must be mixed with faith. And when it's mixed with faith, it gives us the application of our faith and it helps us to understand how we grow through it. Uh, a person of faith should always be directed by their faith, not only pertaining to spiritual things, but also to every arena of our lives. Jesus said this, I must be about my father's business. And I think that is a, it's a great motto that we should all embrace as Christ followers. We should be about what? About our father's business. Now, if that's true, then I want you to grasp something. I want you to write this down today. Write this down because this is the thought that we're going to develop. We live by faith. And we fight by faith. We live by faith and we fight by faith. Now, what is it about the way, and I think that I, I need to put a little caveat in here so that we understand this. What is it about the way that we have taught faith or maybe have heard about faith that it is always about escaping what I'm in instead of remaining faithful while I'm in the battle? Uh, the fight of faith is, is not to determine who wins and who loses. How many of you understand that you are not fighting to win? Why is that? 
Because Jesus already fought and he already won for you. You, you are already in the champion's circle. You already got that. Now, the only thing you and I have to do is finish the race that we are in, and we have to finish it well. Why? By finishing the race, and by finishing the race well, we are actually demonstrating our faith. That's why the Bible says we must remain faithful till the end. What does it mean to be faithful to the end? That means when you reach the end, you are still full of faith. That means when you're there, you're still full of faith. It's not just faithfulness is not just showing up. Faithfulness is showing up with an attitude that I'm an overcomer. Faithfulness is showing up and says, I've already won. Faithfulness is saying, hey, I know that God has already done things for me. Now, I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 as we kind of dig in this. And I'm going to kind of talk about this fighting thing and work through the process of this. Now, watch Hebrews 11. We just read verse 1. And uh, I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version. And look at verse 2. Let's focus on verse 1 and 2. Watch this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, watch verse 2. For by it, somebody say, by it. By what? This faith, right? By it, the elders obtain a what? A good testimony. Now, go down, if you're in Hebrews, go down to verse 32. And I want you to listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. Uh, He says this. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and all the prophets. Now watch this, by faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. Isn't that good? That's good. Watch this, they shut the mouth of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to what? Strength. They became strong where? Where did they become strong? In battle. didn't say they became strong before the battle. It says they became strong where? in the battle and put whole armies to flight. Now, it's that kind of thought that I want to develop today because I think we have to understand and I think we all recognize that sometimes life is is challenging and life is hard and we feel like we're in this fight and we feel like we're losing this fight. But there are two things that we have to understand and we have to, the same way that we apply our faith to receive from God, we have to use our faith while we are in the battle. We have to remain faithful in the battle. We have to fight in this battle, and we have to overcome. So I want you to write this down. Number one, faith helps me when I am battle fatigued. Faith helps me when I'm battle fatigued. Just by looking at some of you, you look a little bit fatigued this morning. And, uh, you know, some of you have not even woken up yet, and I understand because you're that fatigued. But how many of you can just, just answer me very honestly. How many of you sometimes get tired? Okay, I think that is a, that's, a, that's a normal thing. We all get tired. But here's the real question. Not are you getting tired, but are you getting weary? How many of you have sometimes gotten weary? Now, you say, any, what's the difference? Tired is just kind of a natural thing. We all, we, you know, and some of us that are now a little bit older, uh, and as you grow older, you, you know, your energy runs out a little bit quicker than it used to, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I'm, um, you know, 32 right now, and so it's a little bit tougher than it was when I was 22, but the reality is, is that, is that we get battle fatigued, and battle fatigued is one thing, but the, the, there's a part of it that when we get weary, why? Because weariness deals with the soul. And if you've been fighting something in your life, and if you've been having a thing, uh, maybe some challenges in your life, maybe relational challenges, maybe some financial challenges, maybe some emotional challenges, maybe spiritually you've been praying for something and believing God for something, and that has not happened yet, and you've been fighting and believing and trusting, you eventually get to the place that you've got to be very careful not only to grow tired, but to actually grow weary. Now, in Jeremiah 12, this is, and we're not going to camp there, but I want to give this to you, we see that Jeremiah questions God's judgment. And I know none of you have ever done that, but, you know, from time to time, I have myself. And uh, the reason why is because he has issues with God. And he has issues with God because it seems to him that the wicked who don't love God prosper, and those who are deceitful, they always seem so happy. And in his estimation, he says, God, you actually have allowed this to happen. He says, you have allowed this to happen. These people, he says, they, they, they have, they have your, your, your name on their lips, but not as a good thing. Meaning that, you know, they literally use you just as convenience or as a cuss word. 
He says, and I don't like it. He says, God, it seems to me like you planted these people and you've allowed their roots to grow. And look at them. They, they do so well and they prosper so much and, and everything is so great for them. And, and you know why? And he says, as a matter of fact, he keeps on and saying down in verse 4 and, and 5 of uh, Jeremiah 12. He says, God, you know, even, even these people are saying that, that you don't even know the future. You don't even know how things are going to turn out. He says, they, they're literally making a mockery of you yet. It seems like they're always the happy ones. It seems like they're always blessed. And on the other hand, what is Jeremiah saying? He's saying, what about me? You know, I'm not doing too well. And if you know Jeremiah's story, you know that Jeremiah had one of the toughest ministries ever in the Bible. How would you like to have a ministry? And God told you before you start your ministry, nobody is going to listen to you. How, you, how many of you would go in the ministry if God tells you to go in the ministry and you're going to preach? But I just want to let you know that you're going to preach. And the more you preach, people are not going to embrace your message. They are actually going to hate your message. And not only are they are going to hate your message, they're going to start hating you. They're going to hate the messenger. And you know what they're going to do, Jeremiah? They're going to do some evil and mean things to you. And so Jeremiah is now, he's in the beginning of this. And he's in the beginning of, of his ministry in Jeremiah 12. And he's kind of working through this process of saying, well, wait a minute. Wait, you know, what's going on? I want you to listen to what God is going to answer him. So watch this. Uh, look with me to Jeremiah 12, verse 5. And I'm reading this out of the beautiful message uh, 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 transliteration, whatever we call it. Watch this. So Jeremiah, watch this. God is saying to him, so Jeremiah, if you are worn out in this foot race. So God, what is God saying to him? Man. You've only been running in a foot race. You, you, there's not even a fight. Watch this. If you're worn out in this foot race with men, what makes you think you can race against horses? So what is God saying? You think that, that this is tough right now? You think the battle is tough? You, you, you're going from running with people to, to have to run with horses, which means your problems are going to get worse. How many of you would like God to tell you that? Yeah, when you're in trouble, say, wait a minute, your problems is going to get worse. Notice this. And if... You can't keep your wits during times of calm. So, God, so Jeremiah said, this is not times of calm. And God said, yeah, right now, Jeremiah, things are calm. What's going to happen when troubles break loose like the Jordan in a flood? And it's saying, hey, I mean, you've got a little bit of trouble is trickling in right now. But guess what's going to happen in your ministry, Jeremiah? Trouble is going to come like a flood. It's going to overcome you. Right now you've been running with men and you can't even handle that. I want you to run with horses, which means I want you to go to a whole nother different level. Now watch this. God is going to kind of tell him a little bit of what's going to happen. Those closest to you, your own brothers and cousins are working against you. They are out to get you. They'll stop at nothing. Don't trust them, especially when they're smiling. <laughs> My goodness. God, God, God is saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you think, you think you have a tough now. I want you to know, you know, people are turning against you, but those are not your relatives. You know what's going to happen? Your own relatives are now turning. How many of you understand that you need to recognize that you need faith for the battle and faith in the battle? Now, Jeremiah does what we all do from time to time. We complain, and I find it interesting in this particular exchange between Jeremiah and the Lord is that God tells him, if you really want to quit now, while you look at what's going on around you, then you're ill-equipped for what is about to happen in your life. Because even the very people that are close to you are people that are going to turn against you. How many of you would acknowledge that's difficult to swallow? But that's the task that God's laid on Jeremiah. Now, there's two things I want you to watch out for when we are battling in our faith, when we are in this battle fatigue, this fatigue syndrome. Number, number one, or whatever number you want to give it, is what I would term circumstance fatigue. We got to watch out for circumstance fatigue. What is circumstance fatigue? That is working without keeping things in perspective. We all work, and sometimes we work for the kingdom, but we don't keep things in perspective. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6. He says this, We do not want any, anyone to find fault with our work, so nothing we do will be a problem for anyone. But in every way, we show we are servants of God. And I want you to listen to this list. This is astounding. In accepting many hard things. Somebody say accepting many hard things. Now listen to what he's going to say. In troubles, in difficulties, and in great what? 
wait a minute, that's a list that I will not put on my refrigerator. Are you with me? I mean, listen to what he's saying. He says, in every way we show we are servants of God. That means we show we faithful to God in how? In accepting many hard things. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say many hard things. He says on top of the many hard things is what? Trouble. On top of the trouble is what? Difficulty. And not only that, we're going to have some great problems. Would anybody believe God for that? I don't want to believe God for that. I don't want that. Watch this. We are beaten and thrown into prison. We meet those who become upset with us and start riots. We work hard, and sometimes we get no sleep or food. We show we are servants of God. So he's, he's mentioning all these things that they're going through, and then he says, we show we are servants of God by our pure lives, our understanding, our patience and kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by true love. He's saying regardless, he says, what's holding us is that we're keeping things in perspective. Why? Because we know this is a battle, and we know things are tough, and we know things are hard, but we are holding on to God. Why? Because our lives are going to remain pure. We are not going to allow the circumstance of life to determine how we are going to respond. Our faith is going to be the very thing that's going to determine our response. Let me ask you this. Do you allow your emotions to respond, or do you allow your faith to respond? respond. You see, when you allow your emotion to respond, you're going to respond like Jeremiah. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get angry. You're going to mistrust the judgment of God. You're going to say, God, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what's up in my life. You don't understand what's going on. But when you believe God, when you trust God in the midst of it, faith you start putting yourself first, you know what happens? You start measuring, meaning you start living like this. It's kind of tit for tat. It, it's what have they done for me lately? What, what have I received lately? What, what am I getting out of this lately? And when in our estimation we have given more, we assume, here's what happens to us. We assume because I've given more, I deserve more. And because I deserve more, here's what I can do with my life. I can take shortcuts. How many of you like shortcuts? Come on now, just tell, tell me honestly. I mean, how many of you when you drive and your, your navigation system tells you, hey, you know, there's heavy traffic up, up ahead, if you want, you know, and then you've got to hit the button and it will readjust the route and it will guide you away from all the congestion of the traffic. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Does your navigation do that? Or even on your phone, it says, hey, you know what, this is, there's bad traffic up two miles ahead, but you know, there's another way to avoid the traffic. And what I find, and, and sometimes that works. You know, sometimes if you press the button, the, you know, it guides you, you take a few turns, and man, you avoid all the traffic, and you feel like, hey, I win. This is great. But you know what happened a couple of weeks ago in uh, Colorado? I don't know if you saw this on the news. Uh, people were, there was a heavy accident, and uh, the navigation system uh, were telling everybody that they, there will be a shortcut. Do they want to take a shortcut? So over 100 plus people said, yes, we want to take a shortcut. So they hit the button. And you know what they found themselves? They found themselves on the dirt road. Not only did they find themselves on the dirt road, they found themselves stuck in mud because this thing led them to a place where there was no road. But they listened to it. So over 100 people, they literally had some cars they had to dig out of the mud because people were trusting their navigation system instead of trusting just their sins. And they were listening, and it was leading them astray. Now, let me say this to you. God will never lead you astray. And sometimes, here's what I want to say to you. Shortcuts are the quickest way to take the longest road to your destination. Did you get that? Shortcuts are the quickest way to take the longest road to your destination. When we feel we are not getting there, when we feel like that we are not making, then we say, well, you know what, you know, maybe I can cut a little here, cut a little there, but can I tell you something? The one area that you must never cut in is the area of your character. You cannot do that. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Watch this. 
And I'm going to qualify this verse so you understand this. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to what? Fall. The temptations in your life, the what? In your life are no different from what others experience. That means other people have gone through or are going through what you are going through. And God is what? What is God? So He is full of what? Faith. He's full of faith. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you way out so that you can what? Endure. Now listen to me. He did not say that God will not put you in circumstance that you feel that you're overwhelmed. He didn't say that. A lot of times we use this verse and we say, you know, it, you know just blithely we say to somebody that's going through a tough. How to handle it. That's why it's called faith. You don't know how to handle it. You do, that's why it's called dependence. That's why it's called, Lord, I can't work through this. I can't work through forgiving that person. I can't work through in my natural. I don't want to forgive him. I want to kill him. That's what I want to do. So, but I, so what do you need? It's impossible for you, but it's I make the way of escape. He's not talking about the test of life, and he's not talking about the circumstance of life. The context of this is that not that is a lie. If somebody says, well, God won't give you more than you can handle, that's a lie. Yeah. God has given me way more than I can handle. He gave me a wife. That is almost impossible to handle. I think we need to close the service right now. <laughs> and not only that, he gave me you. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Moses, that I give birth to all these people. You're all there. Oh, God, you know, you know, honey, God will never give you more than you can handle. No, he did. I can't handle this. That's why I need the grace of God. That's why I need the mercy of God. That's why I need faith. That's why I don't see it. I, don't, I don't, can't get a hold of it, but I'm going to trust him. I'm going to believe him. But in this context, he's talking about character. He's talking about your character and my character. When we are in the battle, there are going to be seasons in your life that you're going to want to grow weary and you're going to want to grow fatigued because of the circumstance in your life or because of the character failure in your life. Then you have to remember, you got to keep the main thing the main thing. you got to say, I'm in this because God has put me here and God has placed me here and I'm an overcomer. I I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I am more than able to handle what's going on in my life. And I God in this. Why? Because I'm looking for the way out. I'm looking for the escape. I don't have to go down the same path and do the same failure and commit the same sin and do that over and over again. I can overcome by the grace and the mercy of God. That's what that is about. So when we are in the battle, we have got to watch out for battle fatigue. And it comes in those two ways. Can, I, can you handle one more thought? Let me give you one more thought. Secondly, faith enables me to see the enemy's strategies. I want you to, 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 to work with me in this. And the, the biblical example of this is a guy by the name of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, it, that, that's one of the inc most incredible Now he's on his way back. He's, he's starting to fix up uh, the walls of Jerusalem, rebuilding the city. And notice what happens. His enemy, Sanballat, was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? 
Do they think they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones and that? So he's saying, listen, man, they don't even have new bricks. They don't even have new stones. They're literally using the old stones to rebuild the wall. They're literally taking out these old charred burned stones that were burnt, and they're cleaning them up, and they're using them to rebuilding, to rebuilding the wall. Perhaps even if a fox walked along the top of it. So there's mockery going on here. Now I want you to understand this. Every thinking person wishes that armies were not necessary. However, just as there are enemies that would attack other nations, so the church must be engaged against the forces that would love to destroy it. Nehemiah wanted to build, but part of the process to accomplish what needed to be built was the necessity to prepare to fight. Building and fighting doesn't sound like the same thing, does it? Come on now, does it? Building and fighting, it sounds like two totally different endeavors, but sometimes in order to build, we have to fight. And in order to fight, we have to build. And sometimes we have to fight while we build, and we have to build while we fight. So if God talks to us in the book of 1 Peter, and He says that we must build on our faith. So that means we have to build our lives. Spiritually, we have to build our lives. We have to move somewhere. We have to get somewhere. And so, but, but here's, here's the thing that we are thinking. We're thinking, well, if I'm going to build, then everything has to be okay. Everything has to be at peace. Sometimes we feel like, well, I can't build because, you know, all the circumstances are not right. And if you are waiting for all the circumstances to be right to build your life, guess what you'll do? You'll never build. Because sometimes in the midst of building your life, you have to understand that the enemy has a strategy. Why? Because he wants to stop you from building. Because the more you build, the more effective you become, the more stronger you become, and the more impenetrable you become. Why? You now are able to build up and rebuild the walls in your life. Not the walls to keep people out, but the walls that the enemy is trying to get to you. And now you're saying, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to rebuild my life. I'm going to get healthy in arenas of my life. Now, here's the plan of the enemy. Write this in. The enemy's plan is to wound and confuse. There's a lot of reasons why we don't use our faith is because there's some of us that are in a place of confusion, and there's some of us that are in a place of woundedness. Watch this, Nehemiah 4, and let's pick up verse 6. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and the Astrodites and the Termites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were what? Furious. So we see this anger and animosity against them. They all made plans to do what? To come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into what? Confusion. But we pray to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Now notice when the threat of attacks came. The wall was half done. The wall was half done. So here's, here is Nehemiah. And here are the people. They are rebuilding the wall. And as the wall are half done, that means they're doing what God has called them to do. Suddenly the enemy is now even getting worse. The attack is getting greater. And they say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to attack them, and we are going to confuse them. And Nehemiah immediately goes to the Lord, and they prayed and guarded the city, the Bible says. The object in battle, especially in spiritual battle, hear what I'm going to say, is not just to kill enemy soldiers. The object in battle is also to wound enemy soldiers. Why? When a soldier dies, in principle, the army has completed its duty to him. However, when a soldier is wounded, it takes an average of three soldiers to care for him. Now, Satan's tactic in the church is to wound and confuse, why? Those who belong to Christ. And the reason that the church does not do more to attack the enemy of this age, such as crime, poverty, and injustice, is because we spend all of our resources caring for ourselves and have little over to engage the enemy. Now, caring for the wounded is right, and it is biblical, but not at the expense of not obeying what Jesus told us, and that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. 
And a lot of times all of our energy, all of our efforts, all of our outreach is all about healing ourselves instead of really moving forward in faith and in power and accomplishing kingdom business. Now, why is that? Wounded soldiers can't fight. They fret and they are concerned about getting better, about getting well. Now, I want you to write this in in your notes because I want to apply this to us. There are seasons when we need to recover, but a season must not become our permanent reality. We all have had seasons where we were tired, where we were weary. We all had seasons where there were things that were in our lives that we knew we had to heal from. There's nothing wrong with having compassion to heal the wounded. We ought to do that. But how many of you understand we are not just called to heal the wounded. We are called to accomplish kingdom business. We are called to attack the enemy. And there are seasons in our lives where, yes, recovery is needed. But there are sometimes that amazes me that people are dealing with the same stuff they dealt with five years ago. And they're dealing with the same stuff they dealt with ten years ago. Some of our problems are not problems that started yesterday. They are problems that we've carried for a decade in our lives. And I I don't know about you, soon or later, healing has got to come. Now, I know immediately when you say something like that, people, you know, they buck up. They get mad, especially those watching online. They they really get mad. And and they say things like this. Well, guess what? You, You shouldn't tell me how long it takes to heal. True. But really, that sounds to me like the patient is telling the doctor what medicine to prescribe and for how long. When you go to the doctor, the whole, the whole purpose of going to medical for medical help is so that you can get what? You can get well, right? You can get better. And sometimes we don't apply that spiritually in the church. The whole reason why we come and we want to heal emotionally, we want to heal spiritually, is because we want to get better. Why do we want to get better? So that we can function and do what God has called us to do. The problem is we have a whole bunch of wounded people that refuse the treatment. Are you still okay with this message? I want you to write this in. This one is going to be even a little bit more tougher. Are you ready? The pain gets more intense when wounds are being treated, but the healing comes swifter. The pain gets more intense when wounds are being treated, but healing comes swifter. Uh, the, the, the best way that I can describe this to you and is when I was a, a young boy, I think I was about seven or eight, maybe nine at, at, at most, uh, I had a appendicitis, and uh, my appendix was just acting up. We didn't know it was. It was for a couple of days, and eventually went to the doctor. We lived kind of far out. We lived in a little mining town. There's no hospitals, anything like that. And uh, the closest uh, hospital is about 30, 40 miles away uh, in another town. And uh, now remember, this is <laughs> years ago. It was a long time ago. And... Uh, um, I went to the uh, doctor the morning because I just couldn't stand up. I had this incredible pain in, in my side and was just, I, I could barely stand up. And the doctor gave me one look and he told my mom, you got to get this kid straight now. Get in the car, drive as fast as you can. You got to get him to the hospital because his appendix is about to burst. And uh, so my dad and my mom threw me in the car. They, they drove uh, 160, 180 kilometers an hour. I mean, we, we got pulled over by a, by a police officer. And he's like, hey, well, you know, you're driving like a crazy person. What is it? So, you know, my dad quickly said, hey, I got my keys. Got. So he gave us an escort. So he's in front. And, and we were going all the way, uh, you know, to the hospital. And, uh, but that's not the story that I want to tell you. I'm just kind of set it up, you know, kind of, you know, building it up here. And so, so they did an emergency uh, uh, appendectomy. They took my appendix out. It, it ruptured right there as they opened me up. They cleaned me up. And anyway, so I was in the hospital for a few days. But uh, I remember the first night uh, I heard this wailing. And it was a wailing that, I, and remember, I'm, I'm maybe eight years old, nine years old at the most. And I just remember this wailing, this child just crying and wailing and wailing. And, uh, the nur- and this is late at night, and, and the nurse came over to check on me, and I asked her, I said, hey, listen, wh- what is this wailing? And she said, well, you know, uh, um, there's a, bo- a little boy that has been burnt, and uh, we have to wait at night. And what we have to do is we literally have to do what they call uh, debridement. And I don't know if you know what debridement is. And debridement is the process of removing unhealthy tissue from the body. 
the reason for that is because the, the tissue may become necrotic or dead or infected and, and damaged, and it will contaminate uh, uh, any, you know, any new skin that's growing on there, and these foreign, these foreign things must be removed. And back then, and I'm talking about 40 plus years ago, the process of debridement uh, ranges from, you know, my, minor annoyance to very painful, depending on the, the type that they are performing. And literally what they were doing with this little boy, they were scraping his wounds clean of all the debris that was in there. And, and uh, uh, you know, whatever they tried to give him for pain, it, it, just, it just wasn't working. And it was the screams were just incredible as, as you know, this was happening. And, and by the second night, I mean, I literally got out of my bed and I was walking up and down the, uh, uh, the, the corridor. And, you know, the nurse was there and, and I was saying, man, is there anything we can do for this? And she says, no, it, this, this needs to be done in order for him to be well. The bridegroom is often a necessary evil and while it can be painful, many wounds will not heal with this essential process. I want you to listen to these verses in Psalm 77, and then I want to apply this. Watch this. Psalm 77. The psalmist writes, I found myself in trouble, and when looking for my Lord, my life was an open wound that wouldn't heal. When friends said everything will turn out all right, I didn't believe a word they said. I remember God, and I shake my head. I bow my head, then wring my hands. I'm awake all night, not a wink of sleep. I can't even say what's bothering me. I go over the days one by one. I ponder the years gone by. I strum my lute all through the night, wondering how to get my life together. Sometimes we are in a situation that we, we feel just like this. And, 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 and because we know that dealing with this issue, dealing with this hurt, Dealing with this wound is going to produce more pain at first. It might even be worse than the act of what happened to us itself. It might even be worse than the thing. And because we have to, in our mind, we have to relive all of this. We have to experience all of this again. And we say, how can I deal with this? How can I deal with this pain? Because it's so, it's so difficult. But I want you to understand, the pain gets more intense. But if you allow the great physician to apply the debridement of taking out the emotional infections and the things that have messed you up, he will bring you to a place of healing and it will come swifter than you just trying to hold it in all day long. The question you have to ask yourself while you're in the battle, you have to use your faith the same way to receive. You have to use your faith to get well. Are you willing to let the Lord heal you from your wound so that you can fight? Battle wounds are inevitable. But they don't have to be a permanent state of your life. Now, I want to say this to you as we come to a close. God uses broken people, but He cannot use wounded people. Let me say it again. God uses broken people, but He cannot use wounded people. Now, you say, Henny, what's the difference? Real quick, in your notes, write fast. Are you ready? Brokenness versus woundedness. Brokenness focuses on God. Woundedness focuses on me. Brokenness focuses on God's healing. Woundedness focuses on my pain. Brokenness focuses on my responsibility. Woundedness focuses on my rights. Am I going too fast? All right, let's start over. Brokenness focuses on G-O-D. Woundedness focus on M-E, me. Is that slow enough? Okay, second one. Brokenness focuses on God's... You know the answer then. Why are you... I mean, come on. Woundedness focuses on my what? My pain. Brokenness focuses on my responsibility. Woundedness focuses on my rights. Brokenness focuses on my potential. Woundedness focuses on my failure. See, the difference between brokenness and woundedness in that is that brokenness understands, yeah, there's some things that have happened in my life that hurt me. 
There are people that have hurt me. There are people that have done things to me. Yes, they have. And it's affected my life. But guess what? I know that God can use a broken person. Why? Because God loves the brokenhearted in the sense that He not only heals them, but He loves those who are broken of spirit. Why? Because they're humble. Why? Because they're dependent. Which means I'm focusing on what I can become, not on my failure, on how I failed, how I've messed up. Can we, can we be honest in this room? Has any of you failed? Has any of you failed this morning? Don't have to say. All right, we all fail, right? Come on now, we all fail and we all have failed. And so we understand that, but we're going to just focus, woundedness just focus on my failure. Here's another one. Brokenness focuses on the future. Woundedness focuses on the past. Some of you are t- living too much in the rearview mirror of your life, and that's why you cannot move forward. It's always about what, ha- what have they done to me? What have they said to me and yesterday? And, you know, that's why you've been married three times already. It's all about, you know, oh, no, no, no. Well, you know, uh, hey, how about staying married this time and getting better? How about working on the marriage you got instead of wishing for another one? Oh, somebody didn't like that. <laughs> Happy Fourth of July, everybody. <laughs> Let California shake. Listen to this. Brokenness focuses on dependence. Woundedness focuses on self-reliance. Woundedness say, well, if it's to be, it's up to me. We say, well, you know, the Bible says, you know, God helps those people who help themselves. How many of you know that's not in the Bible? God never said that. Jesus never said that. Jesus said, you come and you bring, you dependent on me. And so that's the difference between brokenness and woundedness. And if you say, you know, woundedness, if you look up the word, I made it up just so that you know. It's not in the dictionary. So, but woundedness is, is when we, we focus on all this just like the psalmist is saying. I've got this open wound. I've got this festering thing in my life, and it's not healing. So here's what you have to do. You're not only in the battle because we are in the battle. In the battle, you're going to have to understand that God wants you not to grow fatigued. Yes, you've had trouble. Yes, you had challenges. Yes, you've been running with, with me and men. But now God is saying, I'm taking you to a whole nother level. Can you handle? Because every next, oh, God, just promote me. Oh, God, just bless me. Oh, God, just use me. God says, okay, I'm going to do that. But every next level brings a different devil. And the higher you go, the more challenges you are going to have. We say, no, faith is so that I live a life without challenges. No, 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 no. Faith is so that you can use your faith. And when you use your faith on a little challenge, God gives you a bigger challenge so that you can use your faith on that bigger challenge. Why? So that your faith can grow. So don't grow weary. Don't grow fatigued. Don't wonder, well, why is this happening? What have I done wrong now? Why are you allowing this to happen to me, God? Is it only me that whines like that or is this? (laughs) Two nights ago, we were driving on our way back, and um, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I mean, we're just driving, I'm driving slow, driving the speed limit, which is slow, and, <laughs> but I'm, I'm obeying the law, I'm doing everything right, uh, Pastor Miranda and myself, we just, uh, um, you know, we just laid to rest her grandmother and her brother, and, uh, um, you know, we, we were in, a, in an emotional place, and we were just driving back, and you know, so you already think, oh, you know, God understands. Out of nowhere, this deer comes and decides to have a competition between my truck and itself if it's going to make the other side of the road. And uh, To say, come on, God, don't you realize, you know, we're just married people. I mean, don't you feel sorry for me? I have to take care of everybody, and nobody cares about me. (laughs) Have you ever felt like that? It's like, man, I'm saying, God, you know my tithing record. You know. across the road at a difficult time in my life 
My faith is focused on, okay, now it's a deer, tomorrow it's a demon, but I'm trusting God. Hello, I'm believing God. I'm not going to whine. I'm not going to sit here and whine. And why is this happening? And now I have to deal with this and now I have to deal with that. Because my God is faithful. He's faithful when the deer runs across the road and don't hit me. And he's faithful when the deer misses and hits me. Are you with me, somebody? Because the grace of God is big. And that's why you've got to understand we're in a battle. And what the enemy wants us to do to get sidetracked and start focusing on me and woe is me. Instead of focusing on what God wants to do in and through our lives. Listen to Psalm 147. I'll close with this. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Somebody ought to give me an amen for that. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, and he cast the wicked to the ground. Great is his grace. Great is his mercy. Do you want to get well? That's your question. Or do you want to wallow in your woundedness? Because you have to use your faith in the same way that you use your faith to receive. You have to remain faithful, full of faith, regardless of the circumstance you find yourself in. You have faith for the battle, and you have faith to win. Let's bow our heads this morning. And I want to pray with you and for you. And if you're here today and you're in a place that you say, you know, Henny, it's, it's so easy to say, I know. I know, but we all have challenges. We all have dealt with things that were unjust, unrighteous, unfair. We all have the potential to be deeply hurt and to be deeply wounded. But in this, in this moment, there's grace. In this moment, there's healing in this room. In this moment, God is saying, son, daughter, if you would just allow me to step into your life. Now, here's what it might be. It might be harder. At first, it might be more difficult. It might be more painful. Because when I start to work on you, you might be so reminded of what happened to you. And, 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 and you, you, you're trying to put that so far out of your heart and out of your mind. But yet, it still controls your responses. Yet, it still controls your emotions. Yet, it still controls your feelings. That hurt, that hang up. That place where you try to self-heal, self-lubricate. Well, this, 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 gives me, this gives me ease. This gives me peace. So I just got to do this. I just got to do that. And yet, the more you do of it, the less you have peace. The more you run after things that cannot satisfy, the less satisfaction you get. Say, well, this is going to fulfill me, and, and this, and if I can just have that, or if I can just live there, or if I can just be there, or if I can just get to that side, and then you get there. And you get there, and yet you find yourself still in exactly the same emotional condition. Because on the inside of your heart, God says, let me heal. Let me get in. And let me be the divine physician. Would you trust me to take you through the process that's necessary to make you whole? If you're in this room today, you say, Pastor Henny, that's me. That's me. That's me. Then I want to pray with you. Before I pray with you, maybe you're here today and you've never really embraced Christ as the Lord of your life, the one in charge. You've never accepted Him. I'm going to give you that opportunity. If that's you today, if you're watching online and you've never done that, you've never invited him to be the Lord of your life. What does it mean? The one in charge. You're no longer calling the shots. He does. If you haven't done that, I want to pray with you. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning and you would like me to pray with you, 
and you want to acknowledge that, would you just go ahead and pop your hand up and let me see it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you back there. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, man. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of bringing our heart before Him. And then I'm going to pray for you secondary. Let's just pray together this. Would you help us pray this morning? Pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I acknowledge Name I pray. Amen and amen. Now just remain, remain where you are. If you're here today and you, you know that you've been in that place of woundedness and you need God's grace and God's mercy and you're ready, would you just pop your hand up and say, Henny, that's me. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you. Here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Would we all just stand to our feet? I'm not going to embarrass any of you, but would you just gently put your hand on the person's shoulder next to you? Don't shake them or, you know, start casting things out or anything like that. Just lovingly, just a loving touch. Just a loving touch on their shoulder. That's it. Just a loving touch. Let me pray. Lord, you are the healer of broken hearts. And Lord, sometimes we feel like the psalmist. We have an open wound. We have no answers for it. And the thought of dealing with it it's so far removed from us because sometimes, to be honest, God, we like to wallow in our pain. We like to say, look what they've done to me. Look how they acted towards me. Look at the injustice that was done to me. But today, we don't want to live in the past. Today, we want to say, come, Lord. And yes, we know it. this is not an easy prayer to pray because it's difficult when you take your divine debridement and you move through our souls and you get rid of the debris and the junk and all the toxicity of our souls and you begin to work through the process of bringing us to a place of healing and wholeness. But today, we say, here am I, Lord. Do with me whatever you please. We just want to be broken before you. I no longer want to carry this resentment. I no longer want to carry this anger. I no want to longer carry this wrath. I no longer want to carry this bitterness. I no longer want to carry the stuff that's holding me down and weighing me down. Today, at the foot of your cross, I want to lay this there. And I want to say, whatever the process is, help me to work through it. And remind me every day that I can use my faith in the battle. Remind me every day that I'm not confused about the enemy's strategies, that he wants me to stay in this place of woundedness so that I cannot become the warrior woman that I am supposed to be, so that I will not become that warrior man that I'm supposed to be. Help me now. Re revive the warrior in me so I will fight this fight of faith. And I'll be faithful till the end. Now bring your healing grace in my life in whatever way you desire. And heal me from the inside out. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And I thank you for it. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Now let's give the Lord a clap offering that He is worthy of. Come on, somebody.